Intro to Criminal Justice, lecture number 22 this semester. Yeah, we're uh, proceeding along. Uh, last class period, we finished up our discussions on the sixth chapter, and now we're uh, bouncing over to the eighth and last chapter on policing, uh, which talks about, again, a lot of different uh, problems and issues currently facing law enforcement. And I think probably no better way of looking at it uh, is the fact that here in the United States today we have such major discussions about the role of law enforcement in our society and what, if any, major structural changes need to be known, made to the law enforcement part of the CJ system. And uh, I guess the better way of really starting is discussions here uh, from what early on uh, discovered discussed way back in the 1960s the invention of a concept called the police working personality. Uh, which uh, basically, uh, as you can see from the little chart in your text and discussions in your text, uh, basically uh, is the uh, bringing to the attention of the public the fact that police in general uh, exist in their own cultural bubble and that there are certain traits which officers have or don't have and uh, as a result therefore uh, They develop and operate their lives differently than the rest of society. And a number of things talked about here, uh, again, in your text rather briefly about just exactly what is this police working personality, which parts of it are helpful and which parts of it uh, are not helpful. Uh, One of the things, certainly, is that the nature of the job means that you as a police officer uh, initially have to start learning to develop a thick skin. A thick skin because uh, there are going to be things happening on the job and in the workplace uh, that the average individual isn't going to be faced with. Uh, likewise, again, as talked about already somewhat, but more in this article, there's an awful lot of stress involved in the job, whether real or not. And that certainly leads again, to the developments of certain items or situations uh, which uh, inevitably shape a police officer. So here's some of the things that are talked about uh, that police officers may or may not develop. Uh, authoritarian. Lots of police officers, because they enforce the law, become, in their minds, the law. And, and, and there's a difference there. Okay? Uh, most police, law enforcement people are conservative in 
political beliefs. They certainly like the status quo and they don't like major changes to the status quo. Uh, I might add that we see these same concepts develop no matter what the gender, the race, national origin, etc., of police officers, they develop similar ideas and similar concepts of conservatism. Uh, and, and so uh, don't hesitate to say that the average African-American police officer views lots of what happens from an entirely different perspective than the rest of the African-American community from which they came. And that's part of the relationship here. Normally, uh, police officers are quite cynical. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, cynicism uh, is necessarily as disadvantaged as you would think of. Um, but certainly it does lead to the view among most officers that any person from the other side of the thin blue line, any person they arrest or whatever, is guilty of some crime or the crime which they looked at uh, from the beginning. Uh, but I have to confess that becomes also part of the job. The job being you're there to investigate and arrest criminals and therefore uh, I'm honest. Most of the time they don't deal with many people who are innocent uh, of some form of criminal activity. Uh, many are certainly dogmatic in that they believe what they believe and you can't change their beliefs. Some are efficient, some are not. Um, loyalty certainly to the police department is a key factor. Um, however, um, some traits here, not necessarily so, uh, honorable. And we look at the term honorable, uh, that difference. We as a civilian think honorable means finding an upstanding person. Police department view of it is honorable meaning uh, obey the rules and, and arrest uh, only the guilty. Uh, here on page 242 is a, uh, in my book, uh, I see it in your text too. What page is that on? It says um, rightful policing. That page right Oh, yeah, 245. 245. Uh, a nice discussion. Uh, concepts that right now are really playing out, and that is um, how should policing truly be in operation? Most of this uh, coming about from the uh, Ferguson, Baltimore, and other. Uh, recent situations. After Ferguson happened, two divergent opinions take place in this country. One is that the uh, police presence in Ferguson was uh, extra heavy, was improper, and represented police department out of touch with the neighborhood and the people they were supposed to be protecting. But for the Ferguson Police Department and other police departments in this country, we soon saw comments coming out that Ferguson represented the beginning of a war against police in this country. And therefore, 
it was time to, uh, if you will, to use a, an old Western term, circle the wagons, right? And protect us against all of these comments being made that say what we do is wrong and needs to be improved. So there you have the two sides of the equation. One, the obvious problems with the police reaction there in Ferguson, and I can also say it could also be said problems with police training, and et cetera, in Charlottesville or Baltimore or other places, all of which saying, hey, something needs to be done. We need to have some, something needs to be done in how police operate. Okay. So this particular article talks about uh, how do we judge how effective policing is. And the article basically talks about these two things. What traditionally has measured a successful police department? Okay. The extent to which police are successful in fighting crime and the degree to which police agencies and their officers adhere to the law. And the things we already talked about when we look at missions of law enforcement, right? Crime fighting seems, has always been viewed by the public as the number one role of law enforcement. So how many people you can arrest and how many people, of those people you get, that you arrest can be sentenced, et cetera. Uh, that's... Uh, our number one role that we have looked at traditionally as to whether police are effective. For example, if we talk about the FBI, what's the one thing we think of most? That is the one crime fighting organization in this country with the most success in arresting criminals and all of its many uh, aspects. Despite that fact, however, it's quite obvious that the FBI over the years has had a number of serious flaws, all of which have traditionally been covered up in order to protect its legacy as the ultimate crime-fighting organization. Okay, uh, how well do police uh, adhere to or how well are they faithful to the law? Uh, and, and here again is another issue or another question. Because this is a concept which implies that police must be held just as accountable as other people are if they violate criminal laws and that they're not above being arrested or tried for these laws. And that indeed, I think, is the initial crux of situations like Ferguson and others where you have uh, police officers who obviously act as if they are above the law. We just had finished day four yesterday a trial in which for the first time in over 30 years a Chicago police officer is convicted of a major crime in this case, murder. The police officer who testified on a witness stand in his own behalf that the reason he shot someone 16 times, which meant he had to reload his revolver at least once, was because the individual had threatened him with a knife. 
even though film of the situation seems to indicate the reverse, that the person he shot was shot not as he approached the officer, but as he walked away from it. Now, I'm going to be honest. There still remains some issue in the case over the fact that other uh, information in the case uh, somehow disappeared. And indeed, the video that showed when this individual was shot by a police uh, car uh, camera was kept hidden from the public for almost a year and a half and revealed only over the objection of the entire Chicago Police Department, revealed only when a lawsuit was filed demanding the release of the information and the federal uh, judicial circuit ordered the video shown. Now, when you have, therefore, situations in which apparent mis misuse of their, uh, of their authority, or in other words, the ability of law enforcement to commit crimes and not be punished for them, or to do acts that they're not punished for as the rest of society, it, it certainly causes uh, major problems. So, again, what happens as we look at these two things is that there's in lots of communities in this country an us versus them mentality. Us being the police and then them being anyone who's not a uniformed police officer or who's not a sworn police officer. And sometimes that does change. Now, one of the things that certainly has happened over the years and goes back a long, long ways is in many instances the refusal of the public to accept the fact that there is police misconduct. Now, let me give you a, a great example, one of which most of you are, probably would not ever know about. At one time, the Bluefield City Police Department found itself involved in one of the biggest corruption scandals in southern West Virginia history. And that is that almost half of the police force here in Bluefield were involved in a burglary theft ring of various businesses uptown Bluefield. There may have been as many as nine officers involved, although I'm not sure to this day. Okay? Basically, the situation was, uh, and Bluefield has changed a lot since those times, but at that time, the biggest single employer in the city of Bluefield was called Bluefield Supply Company because it was basically the whole, the company the wholesale uh, intermediate company that supplied everything uh, to all the coal mines in our area. Uh, that company and other buildings along Bluefield Avenue were being broken into and stuff stolen from them by Bluefield police officers who had some of their officers sit as lookouts in their police cars to warn anyone if someone came to discover their ills. Okay? Now this is history that most people don't, don't like to remember. I know it because my father was city attorney at the time it happened. When did this happen? It's in the 60s. Oh God. Late 50s, early 60s, yeah, mid 60s. Uh, I have to look up my stuff again. Uh, a number of these police officers, several were uh, 
tried. Some were pled, gave the, pled guilty and got lesser sentences. But one of the supposed lin, lin, ringleaders in the case was put on trial and tried three separate occasions by the prosecuting attorney, uh, William O. Bivens and Bob Harroyd at the time, three separate criminal trials with all kinds of evidence against him. And in each time of the trial, the jury refused, the jury, uh, it, it was either a hung jury or they could not come to a decision to convict him. He was finally acquitted. Even though there was lots of proof. And why did the jurors not convict him? Because at this time in the late 1950s and early 60s, Police could do no wrong. Police didn't do bad things. Even though you had this major scandal here in Bluefield, the overstanding view was that it was only a few involved and was not near as widespread as apparently the evidence uh, may have shown. Now, I make this comment only because I want you to understand that lots of times in police departments all around this country, we have issues of police corruption and violation of laws, etc. Not all of them involve shooting people, <laughs> okay, which is what's talked about a lot. That's all we hear about, right, is, you know, shooting incidences, gunfire incidents. But the truth is, that law enforcement in this country has a long history of other types of corruption, as is pointed out in your text. So what am I trying to bring out is that normally speaking, juries in this country don't find police officers guilty of crime. Why? Because they don't believe police officers commit crimes. Now, I say it, mention it, because police officers are people, right? They're human beings. They have values, they have biases, they have prejudices, and sometimes they cross the line. And it happens all over. But the belief that they never cross the line is one of the problems that led to situations like Ferguson, Baltimore, and other places where, in essence, it, the, <clears throat> the public starts dividing itself between, hey, the police couldn't have done this, and hey, the police always do this. So look again at this uh, discussion of this uh, 2015 study, again, talking about what is rightful policing and that, again, is an invention of the author of the study. He's not talking about how many crimes, uh, how many people are arrested for crime. It's not talking about fidelity. It's talking about the issue of uh, public perceptions of law enforcement and how that is. Is the way that law enforcement treats the public right or wrong? And, and these are things I think we have to look at. Uh, I, I keep hearing more and more uh, studies being brought out, again, discussing this issue, that somehow or another there needs to be changes in the basic police personality culture in order to make law enforcement more... Um, more serving of the public. Uh, I'm not an anti-police person per se. I know that bad things happen. However, it's estimated that 97% of all police officers in this country never fire their weapon during their employment. That's a rather staggering Statistic, isn't it? That's right. Most police officers 
what's uh, what's there involved in policing and uh, learn that drawing your police weapon is not the most effective way to handle any situation. But again, in most because most situations, again, gunfire is rare, period. Now, we have a number of TV shows on uh, in which it appears that at least in several U.S. cities, uh, there are violent gun fights and gun battles going on all the time. Uh, the one I like that I watch sometimes with uh, amazement is the show called SWAT, which implies that LA SWAT teams every day of the week are involved in some sort of mass shootout of some type or another. Uh, the reality is quite different. Quite different. Uh, I've been watching with interest this new show called the FBI, which presents FBI agents once again, uh, mass bombings, uh, all uh, poison gas attacks, all sorts of things taking place and happening in which basically it implies that FBI agents are always involved in some kind of violent physical confrontation. And the result is absolutely not so. You know what probably as much of a bulk of things the FBI does? One is a major part of their uh, efforts are, of course, all, uh, computer automation, fingerprint identification, etc. Mugshot identification, those, uh, those things. Uh, I can't tell you how many FBI agents are involved in do, doing background checks on people applying for sensitive federal jobs or other FBI agents. And whatever your view is about the Kavanaugh situation, uh, here again is an individual who's applied, who's worked at more than one federal job. Every time he applied for a job, he had an FBI background investigation made of him. Again, certain parts of the FBI, that's all they do. They don't go out guns are blazing. And rarely are they involved in major serial murder situations. Uh, as another TV show, of course, oh, Criminal Minds implies, right, that uh, 22 times a year, the FBI is involved in major monstrous serial murderer cases uh, through some unit in Quantico, which has so much money that it can fly around in its own private jet plane uh, all over the country, right, to investigate serial murder <laughs> situations. And, and the statistics on that are pure hokey uh, when it comes to the actual number of serial murderers involved at any one time, the number of one serial murder cases involved at any one time. The uh, general estimate is that we probably have maybe 14 serial murderers in the U.S. In the operating in any one given year. And, and that may be a high estimate. Okay? It may be a high estimate. Um, so, anyway. I guess what I'm trying to say is most law enforcement are not involved in violent situations until it seems we have other issues. Okay. Now, I want to shift, therefore, from initially from discussions about uh, improper use of deadly force, and we'll talk more about that most likely next class period as I get ready to try to wrap this chapter up. But what I really want to talk about is police corruption in and of itself. And most police corruption 
again, doesn't involve uh, unreasonable force. It involves other things. Look here uh, in your text at the uh, triangular shape chart it has. Uh, what page is that on? 248. 248. This is a chart that discusses the major types of police corruption. And I want you to notice that the top of the triangle is the area that we hear about the most. Physical abuse of suspects, torture, unjustifiable homicides. And by the way, I might add that unjustifiable homicide, if you were to take that out of the top and put it at the top, would be the smallest thing ever discussed about police corruption issues. Now, there are lots of studies, again, regarding police corruption. Uh, and to be honest, it, it varies. Uh, one thing which has always been in play is always the issue of the fact that many, many uh, business owners, particularly restaurants, etc., uh, routinely uh, try to offer police uh, free coffee, free donuts. Uh, you know, just as, as a favor to supporting law enforcement. There's always been an issue as to whether or not accepting those gratuities puts officers, you know, in trouble. Uh, several times a year, Grant's uh, supermarkets gives to all first responders, not just police, uh, simple bag lunches, which basically is a sandwich, what potato chips, uh, maybe a drink. Um, that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this issue of uh, gratuities. You have a restaurant in which police normally go because they always get free coffee, and of course, that proverbial favor of police officers, particularly, I guess, northern police officers, jelly-filled donuts. Uh, that probably is an urban myth, I guess, because, to be honest, I know a lot of police officers who can't stand the damn jelly donut either if it's given to them. <laughs> you know, uh, they might like a regular donut, but not, not anyway. Uh, and again, uh, Lots of studies have shown, lots of police officers, police chiefs have basically said that when you get in the habit of accepting free stiff stuff being given to you just because you're a police officer, then that means other things start happening. And one of them is the issue of favoritism based on what those free gratuities were. Uh, the text talks about it as selective enforcement of the law, meaning some people are never giving tickets. Why? Because they're friends with police officers or uh, they know them. I'm going to confess I have taught hundreds of police officers in my day. And I've always told them, if you see me speeding, give me the damn ticket. No, don't let me get out of it, because you know who I am. And yes, I have gotten a few speeding tickets in my day. Not recently, but I get some. But in any of those cases, I don't use my role as a CJ instructor over all these years to get out of the ticket. Why? Because I find that that kind of selective issues is wrong. If police officers are supposed to be faithful to the law, then they're going to give a ticket to anybody, no matter who it is, uh, whatever. 
I always remember one of the scandals here in Bluefield involved a well-known lawyer, and I won't say anything about who the lawyer was or what firm he was with, uh, who was at a local nightclub and got just stewed and was stopped by the police as he tried to get his car moving for drunk driving, and the charges later reduced to improper backing. I never knew exactly what Mr. Reader's statute improper backing violated, but I always remember at the time that here is an example of someone giving, shall we say, favorable treatment. Uh, and I might add, favorable treatment goes all the way down the line, you know, depends on which side of the coin you're on or not. Uh, but again, when you have those situations that occur in which some people are apparently immune from arrest and others are not, once again, that's a disservice to the police department and to the public. And finally, of course, uh, next, of course, then we have the next thing that starts happening after sometimes selective law enforcement, and that's called bribes, minor bribes. Yes, there used to be some communities in our state and lots of other states in which basically police officers stop you for a traffic offense. You give him two hundred dollars and the ticket goes away. Okay, that's called a bribe. And and I'm honest. Uh, the concept of bribery takes place all over the place, but it's one of those things that we in our society, at least here, have always thought of improper meaning that the ability to pay your way out of criminal charges is not right, should not be right. And I'm honest, I don't believe it should be right either. If you're rich and you can afford to buy your way out of things, okay, and I, I hear situations all the time oh, about somebody being charged with major offenses and after spending several hundred thousand dollars, they get out of the case. Uh, that shouldn't be the way criminal justice and law enforcement operate. Okay? Shouldn't be the way things operate. And again, some bribes are not minor. Some bribes are a lot more than minor. There is no doubt, you know, this happens. In McDowell County, some years ago, the Sheriff's Department in McDowell County was involved in a systematic series of bribery through a protection racket they operated. The Sheriff and his Chief Deputy for many years basically went around McDowell County to various businesses and collected from them $50 a week or a month or whatever, I think it was $50, either a week or a month. And in return for that $50, they were guaranteed that sheriff's deputies would be patrolling their premises, right? And they would get protection. If you didn't pay them the 50 bucks, you'll never see a police, you wouldn't see any sheriff's department. And again, now McDowell County doesn't have a lot of big towns, so the Sheriff's Department has always been the, the bulk of law enforcement in McDowell County. So every business in Welch and Yeager and different places, they all coughed up until suddenly a rather courageous federal uh, U.S. attorney got involved in looking at the situation and the sheriff and his chief deputy both went to prison. Again, 
a systematic sense of bribery, right? Pay us and you don't have any worries. Don't pay us and you do. Now I'm talking about these situations because I want you to understand that this is the type of police corruption which probably is the most common. Now in many larger cities we have, I've still got three minutes left, we still have major issues regarding uh, police officers uh, who get involved in uh, narcotics. And that's because most of them, again, are narcotics detail and somehow or another it bleeds over. The most recent scandal involving the New York City Police Department is not uh, shooting an unarmed person, but rather the fact that a retired 20 year veteran of the uh, NYPD was discovered running a prostitution ring in New York City. And that for some magical reason, uh, officers who were trying to uh, find out his various houses where he operated from were all their raids were always tipped off. It's because seven police officers in the department where he used to work were calling him and tipping him off about future raids that were going to happen. And that again, a typical example of police corruption. Uh, here is this police officer who suddenly is making millions of, uh, over a million dollars a year running prostitution ring there in New York City only because, right, of his contacts in the police department. Okay, well, we're going to talk more about police corruption and more about other situations uh, next class period uh, in lecture 23 this semester. Unless I have questions here in class, we'll close for now and I'll move on.